Mike spoke about the case interview, let's focus on the equally important behavioral interview. And where does it fit in the hiring process? Well, we saw that there's a chat in the beginning of the interview. Tell me about yourself, random things, just to make the candidate at ease. Then we go to the personal experience interview. And the personal experience interview is where you're going to be, as, a, as an interviewer, you're going to be assessing the candidate into the kind of skills that, as a consultant, you need to show on your work. Why do you use that specific type of interview to get to those skills? The behavior interview is where you try to ask questions on the candidate's past, and by assessing his behavior in the past, you assume that he would, be, he would have a similar behavior in the present, so if he was faced with that same situation. But there are other assessment tools. You could try to do a simulation, and actually some consulting firms do that. They throw you a case, and then you have to solve it for a certain period of time, and then you have to present the solution to the interviewer. But that's not the case with McKinsey, BCG, and Bain. Very, uh, they stick to the behavioral interview. And of course, another way of getting into, the, into those behavioral skills would be if I were to ask you, imagine you are in this scenario, what would you do? Now the thing is that consulting firms don't believe it's such an accurate way of, of assessing a candidate. Because you could, you could try to say whatever the, the interview is looking for. So that's why, as consultants, we resort to the behavioral interviewing. So how is it structured? The first part is to prepare the candidate because it's not a very familiar way of interviewing. So you brief the candidate and tell them we're going to speak about an experience in your past, and I'm going to be asking you questions, I'm going to be interrupting you. So the candidate doesn't panic, am I doing something wrong? Because he's all the time asking questions. There's a lot of questions because we need to probe your story. And sometimes raise uncomfortable questions. So this is to make sure that the candidate knows what's going to happen. And then we start with selecting an experience because the behavioral interview is going to focus on one experience. It's important that that experience is well chosen. Because if you think an experience where you didn't demonstrate any skill, it's not going to go well. So there's something like five minutes where the interviewer is, give me a snapshot of that experience, just to see if I think it makes sense. And if it doesn't, well, can you think about another experience? I don't think that one is so relevant. And once you have that experience, then you start probing the experience. Probing the experience is going deep in that, with a lot of questions. So, how do you actually pick the experiences? Most of the time, it's an open question. I would ask the candidates, well, tell me about a situation where you did this. And then the candidate can come up with any experience. Sometimes I would pick something on the CV of the candidate that I would find interesting. Well, I see that you had this role at this organization. You are managing a product development team, so can you tell me about that? Regardless of, of the experience you pick, of course, that the probing is going to be the same. You're evaluating three basic things. The first one is the leadership potential. And here there are two very important elements. One is teamwork. How good are you at working with other people? At solving conflicts inside teams? And the second is leading others. Taking, inspiring a vision in others. Making them move, achieve results. What is the evidence that you are able to do that? That's the leadership part. The second skill is the drive which includes your goal orientation and persistence in face of adversity. It also includes your entrepreneurship. If you are someone that can find opportunities and seize them, even if these opportunities are not within your uh, immediate sphere of influence. And then another skill that is assessed, and this one is not really graded, but it's more of a soft assessment, that is the personal impact. The personal impact comes down to, if this person was in my team, would I be comfortable in having him in front of the client, in front of a senior client? So
So for that, you need to have poise. Poise means how you present yourself, how confident you are. If you are challenged in the case, do you keep calm or do you start shaking? And another thing is how good you are at influencing other people. So if you have faced a disagreement in the past, how good you were at really making the person change opinions and win that person to your side. So leadership drive and personal impact are what we as interviewers are looking for in candidates. So let's see an example of questions for these three skills. For leadership, I would ask, tell me about a situation where it was a challenge to lead someone or a group of people. If you haven't prepared an answer for this, you're going to struggle. Uh, let me think. Well, uh, leadership, well, it's a very bad start. So of course, you need to think about these things beforehand. And notice that here, we are not being specific on the context. So it's not necessarily leadership like a former role in a company. It's about leading a person or a group of people. So you can be leading people, even well, friends organizing something, or a student organization. There's plenty of examples where you can show leadership. So even for those who don't have work experience, there are other ways to show that. Drive. Drive would be an example of a challenging goal, not something obvious, that you set and achieved, and where you face some kind of struggles. Were you perseverant in that? And then the final one, the personal impact. A time, think about a time when you had to convince someone that was of a different opinion from yours. What did you do? So all these things, if you face them for the first time in the interviewer, you risk blanking. You risk not knowing what to say. Or you risk starting mumbling and telling a story that is not coherent. So, how is it a good discussion around a certain experience? Well, a good discussion has three features. The first one is that it is relevant. So if you are being asked about, I don't know, leadership, you cannot say that, I don't know, I organized uh, a birthday party. Well, unless it was the biggest birthday party on the planet and you really moved a huge group of people to, to achieve an outstanding party, yes, otherwise no. So relevance is an experience that addresses what the interview is looking for. And here you have to remember that the interviewer is not your enemy. The interviewer is not trying <coughs> to discredit you. But he's going to try to probe you. That's why the second part is about responding to the questions. Because the interviewer is controlling the discussion and he is probing you. He wants to make sure that your story is not something that you rehearsed. So he's going to ask you a lot of questions. What did you think when you did that? And what was the effect? And what did you do? And why did you do it? And for some people it may be a bit uncomfortable. You think, well, he's not believing me. It's not the case. It's we are probing you. So it, it really trying to get into your mind and, and recreate the situation. And then the final element of it is role. Be focused on your role. Don't say things like, we did this and my team did that. No, what did you specifically do? How did you contribute in a very detailed and tangible way so that I as an interviewer can run the video, the picture in my mind and that you can convince me that you have that skill? Now in the same way that I would grade the candidates for the problem solving, it's exactly the same for the behavioral with a minor exception. So we would have the same levels but the way we grade would be that we start by grading in the low level, level one. But when you start demonstrating that in influencing a group of people, you used these influencing tactics, okay, then you move to the level two. And when you demonstrate to the interviewer that you use these other sets of influencing tactics, then you move to the level three. So it's a very conservative way of evaluating and sometimes it can be unfair because it doesn't mean that you didn't have 
the skill, but you didn't demonstrate it. So in that sense, it's a little bit different from the problem solving. Even though the form has the same levels, the problem solving is a direct rating. The behavioral rating is evolving. So you move and you go the highest you can get. It depends how convincing you are in telling the story. Now, you may be an extraordinary leader, but if you don't give me that evidence, I cannot rate you on a high, on a high score. And that would sometimes be the case. And we are conservative. When, when, when I was rating, I could not give high scores, even if I would think that, that probably that person is better than he is telling me. But I don't have evidence. And if I don't have evidence, I cannot score high. So at the end of the day, you are going to be combined the problem solving and the behavioral traits. And the behavioral traits are as important as the problem solving because ultimately, if you are distinctive in the behavioral, you can be only bar average on the problem solving and you still get higher. And normally, it's easier to prepare for the behavioral part than for the problem solving. Because the behavioral skills is not that you really need to change your skills. The, the problem solving part, yes, you need to develop those skills. You need to develop a new way of thinking. But the behavioral skills, you have them. You're not going to change that. What you're going to change is how you tell the story, how you demonstrate those skills to your interviewer. 